The Complete Visions of and Catherine Emmerich Jesus left Nazareth to go to Bethsaida where he aimed at rousing some of the people by his teaching. The Blessed Virgin and his followers remained behind. During his stay in Nazareth, Jesus had stopped with his friends in his mother's house. But so much discontent and murmuring arose in the little town on his account that he resolved to go to Bethsaida for a while and return to Nazareth at some future time. He was accompanied by Amanda, the son of Veronica, a son of one of the three widowed relatives of Jesus, whose name sounds like Sirach, and one of Peter's relatives known later as one of the disciples. At Bethsaida, Jesus taught very forcibly in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He told his hearers that they should now enter into themselves, repair to the baptism of John, and purify themselves by penance. Otherwise a time would come when they would cry there were many people in the synagogue, but none of the future apostles, excepting, I think, Philip. The others, belonging to Bethsaida and the country around, were celebrating the Sabbath elsewhere. They were in a house near the fishery in the neighborhood of Capernaum. During this preaching of Jesus, I prayed that the people would go to the baptism of John and be truly converted. Thereupon I had a vision in which I saw that John was the who washed from the people their rawness, their coarseness. I saw him working so actively, so vigorously, preaching so vehemently that his camel skins slipped from shoulder to shoulder. This, I think, was merely symbolical, for at the same time I saw something like scales falling from some of the newly baptized, black vapors issuing from others, and light, shining clouds descending upon others. In Capernaum also Jesus taught in the school. Crowds came from all sides to hear him, among them Peter, Andrew, and many others who had already been baptized by John. When Jesus left Capernaum, I saw him teaching two hours distant from the city toward the south. His hearers were numerous. He had with him only the three disciples, for the future apostles who had heard him in Capernaum had, without exchanging words with him, gone again to the sea. Jesus spoke here also of John's baptism and the fulfilled promise. He then went on toward the south, teaching here and there, down to lower Galilee in the direction of Samaria, and kept the Sabbath in a school between Nazareth and Sepphoris. The holy women from Nazareth were present, also Peter's wife and the wives of some others of the future apostles. The place consisted of only a few houses and a school. It was separated from Anna's former residence by a field. Of the future apostles, Peter, Andrew, James the Less, and Philip, all disciples of John, Carn to hear Jesus. Philip belonged to Bethsaida. He was tolerably well educated, and was much engaged in writing. Jesus did not tarry long here. He took no meal, but only taught. The apostles had, probably, celebrated the Sabbath in the neighborhood, for the Jews often visited other places on the Sabbath. Being informed of Jesus' presence, they had come to hear him. He had not yet spoken to any of them in particular. From the last place, Jesus crossed a mountain with the three disciples and went to Sephoris, for hours' distance from Nazareth. He stopped at his great aunt's. She was Anna's youngest sister Marha, and the mother of a daughter and two sons. These sons were habited in long, white garments. They were named respectively Aristeria and Cocaria, and later on they joined the disciples. The Blessed Virgin, Mary Cleophas, and other women had also come hither. The feet of Jesus were washed, and a repast prepared in his honor. He passed the night in Marha's house, which had been the home of Anna's parents. Sephoris was a large city, and in it were three different sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenians, each with its own school. This city often suffered severely from war. At the present day, it is scarcely in existence. Jesus stayed some days here, preaching and exhorting his hearers to go to the baptism of John. He taught in two synagogues on the same day, in a large, high one, and in a small one. The large one belonged to the Pharisees. They listened indignantly to his words, and murmured against him. The women were present at this instruction, but in the other synagogue, the small one that belonged to the Essenians, there was no place for women. Jesus was kindly received by the Essenians. 
As Jesus was teaching in the school of the Sadducees, something very wonderful took place. There were in Sephora's numbers of demoniacs, simpletons, lunatics and possessed. They were instructed in a school near the synagogue, which latter place they were obliged to attend when prayer and teaching were going on. They had a hall in the rear reserved for themselves, and they were made to listen attentively. Custodians armed with whips stood among them, each with few or more under his charge, according as they were more or less troublesome. Before Jesus entered, I saw these poor creatures during the teaching of the Sadducees distorting their countenance and falling into convulsions. Their keepers had to bring them to order with a lash. When Jesus made his appearance, they were at first quite still, but after a little while one began and then another to cry out, That is Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, and visited by wise men from the east. His mother is now with Maraha. He is preaching new doctrine, which we must not tolerate. And so they went on recounting aloud the whole life of Jesus and all that had happened to him up to the present time. Now this one began, then that one took it up. The lashes of the custodians availed not, for soon all began to cry out together, and the confusion became general. Then Jesus commanded them to be brought to him outside the synagogue, and he sent two disciples to collect all the other insane from the different quarters of the city and bring them also. Soon there was a crowd, fully fifty such unfortunates around him, and multitudes of others, all eager to see what would happen. The insane kept up their cries. Then Jesus spoke, saying, The spirit that speaks through these is from below. Let it again go below. And at the same instant, all became quiet. They were cured, and I saw several fall to the ground. And now a great tumult, excited by the cure, broke out in the city, and Jesus and his followers were in great danger. The excitement became so great that Jesus escaped into a house and left the city that night. The Blessed Virgin, the three disciples, with Cocaria and Aristeria, the sons of Anna's sister, left the city also. The mother of Jesus was in great trouble and anxiety, for this was the first time she had seen her son so violently persecuted. Jesus had appointed some trees outside the city as a meeting place, and from there all went on together to Bethulia. The majority of those cured by Jesus and Sephorus went to John's baptism. Later on they were the principal ones of the city who followed Jesus. Bethulia is that city at whose siege Judas slew Holofernes. It was built on a mountain southeast of Sephorus. The view from it extended far around into the distance. Magdalene's castle in Magdalene was not far off, and Magdalene herself was at this time at the height of her glory. Bethulia, too, possessed a castle and the place was rich in springs. Jesus and his disciples entered in and outside Bethulia, and thither came Mary and the holy women again to meet him. I heard Mary talking to him, begging him not to teach here again, for she was afraid there might be another insurrection. But Jesus replied that he knew what he had to accomplish. Mary asked, Shall we not now go to John's baptism? To which Jesus answered gravely, why shall we now go to John's baptism? Have we need of it? I shall journey and reap still a while longer, and I shall say when it is time to go to the baptism. As afterward at Cana, Mary kept silence. I have seen that the holy women received baptism not till after Pentecost, and then in the pool of Bethsaida. The holy women went on into the city. Jesus taught on the Sabbath in the synagogue, and many from the country around came to hear him. Here in Bethulia, also, I saw numbers of insane and possessed on the high road outside the city and, here and there, on the streets through which Jesus passed. They were quieted and freed from their paroxysms. The people said among themselves, This man must possess a power like unto that of the ancient prophets, since those unfortunates grow calm on his appearance. They felt benefited by his presence, even though apparently he did nothing special for them and so they sought him in the inn to thank him. He taught and exhorted to John's baptism, and spoke with as much vehemence as did John himself. The people of Bethulia gave to Jesus and his followers a most honorable reception. They would not allow him to put up at the inn outside the city, 
but strove among themselves as to who should have the honor of entertaining him in their houses. They that had not Jesus, at least wanted one of the five disciples who were with him. But they, the disciples, would not leave their master. At last, Jesus promised to make the inn and the houses of the good people his headquarters alternately. Their great enthusiasm and love for him were not altogether disinterested, and Jesus charged them with it during his instruction in the synagogue. They had a secondary design. They wanted, by entertaining the new prophet, to attract to their city that esteem which they had lost by their trade and intercourse with heathens. They were also destitute of a pure love of truth. When Jesus left Bethulia, I saw him in a valley teaching under the trees. Besides the five disciples, there were now about twenty others following him. The holy women had already returned to Nazareth. Jesus had left Bethulia because he was so much besieged by the people. Numbers of sick and possessed from the country around had gathered in the city, hoping to be cured, but Jesus did not as yet wish to heal so openly. As he journeyed away from Bethulia, he left the Sea of Galilee behind. The place in which he next taught was an old place of instruction formerly used by the Essenians, or prophets. It consisted of an elevated, grassy mound surrounded by little parapets against which the audience could rest comfortably. There were about thirty people around Jesus in this place. That evening I saw him with his followers arrive at the little village with its synagogue, about one hour's distance from Nazareth, whence not long before he had set out to go to Sephoris. The inhabitants received him with every mark of kindness. They conducted him to a large house in front of which was a courtyard, washed his feet, as also those of the disciples, cleaned and brushed his traveling garments and prepared for him and his followers a repast. Jesus taught here in the synagogue. The holy women were in Nazareth. Next day he went about two miles further on toward the Levitical city, Seeds or Sesion. He was followed by about seven possessed, who still more plainly than those of Sephoris, proclaimed his mission and history. Aged priests and youths in long, white garments came forth from the city to meet him for some of his followers had already gone before him into the city. Jesus did not free the possessed here. They were confined in a house by the priests, that they might not create disorder. But he freed them later after his baptism. He was quite well received and entertained in this place, but when he proposed to teach, they questioned him, what call had he? What mission? Was he merely Joseph and Mary's son? Jesus answered evasively that he who had sent him and to whom he belonged would make all that known at his baptism. He taught many other things on this point and also of the baptism of John. His instructions were given on a hill in the center of the place where, as at Thebes, a stand had been prepared for the purpose, not exactly in the open air, but under a rush-covered tent or shed. Jesus went from here through the pastoral region where later, after the second Pasch, he healed the leper. He taught in the different little villages around. But for the Sabbath, he went with his companions to Jezreel, a scattered place, the houses, which were built in groups, being separated from one another by ruins, towers, and gardens. A high road ran through the city, called King's Street. Jesus had with him only three of his companions, several having gone on before. Jezreel was the home of strict observers of the Jewish law. They were not Essenians, however, but Nazarites. They made vows for a time, longer or shorter, and practiced various kinds of mortification. They had a large institution, comprising different sections. The unmarried men occupied one part exclusively, the unmarried women another. The married also made vows of continency for a certain period, during which the husbands lived in the house next to that of the unmarried men while the wives retired to that of the single women. They were all habited in gray and white. Their superior wore a long, gray garment edged with fringe and little white ornaments like fruit, and bound by a gray girdle on which were inscribed white letters. Around one arm was a band of coarse, gray and white woven stuff as thick as a twisted napkin, one end of which ornamented with tufted fringe hung down a little. He wore a collar, or a little mantle, almost like that of Argos, the Essenian, accepting that it was gray and open behind instead of in front. 
A blank shield was fastened on it in front, while behind it was tied or laced. On the shoulders hung slit lappets. All wore black, shining, puffed caps, with some words stamped on the front. Three bands met on top forming a ball, which, like the rim, was white and gray. The Nazarites had long, thick curly hair and beards. I tried to think which of the apostles looked like them and, at last, I remembered that it was Paul. His hair and garments, when he persecuted the Christians, were in the style of the Nazarites. I saw him afterward, also, with the Nazarites, for he was one of them. They used to let their hair grow until their vow was accomplished, when they cut it off and burned it in sacrifice. They sacrificed pigeons also. One could assume and fulfill the unfulfilled vows of another. Jesus celebrated the Sabbath with them. Jezreel is separated from Nazareth by a mountain range. Not far from it is a well near which Saul once encamped with his army. Jesus taught on the Sabbath of the baptism of John. He said that, although their piety was praiseworthy, yet excess was dangerous, that there are different ways to salvation, that splits in the community would easily give rise to sex, that, in their pride, they looked down upon their weaker brethren who could not do so much as they themselves but who should be succored by the stronger. Such teaching as his was very necessary here, for in the suburbs there were people who had mixed with the heathens, and who were destitute of rule or direction, because the Nazarites had separated from them. Jesus visited these people in their homes, and invited them to his instruction on baptism. Next day Jesus was present at a repast given him by the Nazarites, at which circumcision was spoken of in connection with baptism. For the first time, I heard Jesus speaking of circumcision, but I cannot exactly recall his words. He said something to this effect, that the law of circumcision had a reason for its existence which would soon be taken away, when the people of God would come forth no longer according to the flesh from the family of Abraham, but spiritually from the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Great numbers of the Nazarites became Christians, but they clung so tenaciously to Judaism that many of them, seeking to combine Christianity with it, fell into heresy. When Jesus left Jezreel, he journeyed a while toward the east, then went around the mountain which lay between Jezreel and Nazareth, and, about two hours from the former place, reached a number of houses standing in rows on either side of the high road. They were occupied by publicans. Some poor Jews dwelt under tents at a little distance from the road. That road, along which the dwellings of the publicans stood, was fenced in by wickerwork, the entrance at either end being closed. Rich publicans lived here who rented many tolls in the country, and again leased the same to under-collectors. Matthew was one of these latter tax-gatherers, but belonging to another place. Mary, the niece of Elizabeth, once dwelt here, I think. Having become a widow, she went to Nazareth and afterward to Capernaum. She was the same that was present at the Blessed Virgin's death. The commercial high road to Egypt from Syria, Arabia, and Sidon passed through this place. Great bales of white silk and bundles like flax were brought this way on camels and asses. Also fine woolen stuffs both white and colored, great, heavy, woven strips of carpet, and lastly spices. When the camels arrived in this district, the gates were closed and the merchants had to unpack their goods, which were carefully examined. They had to pay a tax, partly in merchandise, and partly in money. The latter was mostly three or four cornered yellow, white, or reddish pieces, on which was stamped a figure, raised on one side and hollow on the other. They gave also coins different from these. I saw on those coins little towers, a virgin, also an infant in a little ship, Little bars of gold, such as were offered by the kings at the crib, I never saw again excepting with some strangers who came to John the Baptist. The publicans were all leagued together. When one received more than his fellows, he divided with the rest. They were wealthy and lived well. Their homes were surrounded by courtyards, gardens, and walls, reminding me of those of our well-to-do peasants. They lived entirely among themselves, for others would not associate with them. They had a school of their own and a teacher. Jesus was well received by them, his followers also. I saw several women arrive here. I think Peter's wife was among them. 
one of them spoke with Jesus, and they soon went away. Perhaps they were either coming from or going to Nazareth, and were executing some commission for the mother of God. Jesus stayed first with one, then with another of the publicans, and taught in their school. He especially pointed out to them the fact that they often extorted from travelers more toll than was just. They became very much confused, and could not divine how he knew that. They were more humble than the other Jews, and took his words better. Jesus urged them to receive baptism. Jesus left the publicans after having taught among them the whole night. Many of them desired to make him presents, but he would accept nothing. Several followed him, for they wanted to go with him to baptism. On this day, he journeyed through the country by Dothain and passed the madhouse where, on his first journey from Nazareth, he had calmed the raving and the possessed. As he was passing it, they called him by name and clamored violently to be released. Jesus commanded their custodians to free them, promising that he would answer for the consequences. They were all set at liberty. Jesus cured them all, and they followed him. Toward evening, he arrived at Kislev, a city on Mount Thabor, inhabited mainly by Pharisees. They had heard of Jesus, but they were displeased at seeing him followed by publicans, whom they looked upon as malefactors, possessed known to be such, and a motley crowd of others. He entered their school and taught of the baptism of John. Then, addressing his followers, he exhorted them before attaching themselves to him to think seriously whether they would be able to persevere or not, for they must not think his path an easy one. He expounded to them also several parables on building. If a man desired to build himself a house, he should consider first whether the owner of the ground would allow him to use it for that purpose. In like manner, they that would follow him should first expiate their offenses and do penance. Again, if a man would erect a tower, he must first estimate the cost. And many other things Jesus taught that were not well received by the Pharisees. They listened only to catch him in his words. I saw them concerting together to give him an entertainment at which they hoped to ensnare him in his speech. They prepared a great feast in the public hall, down which stood three tables, side by side, and right and left burned lamps. Over the middle table, at which Jesus, some of the disciples, and the Pharisees sat, the aperture, customary in the roofs of that country, stood open. The followers of Jesus were seated at the side tables. In this city there must have been an ancient custom commanding the poor, of whom there were numbers dwelling in the greatest abandonment, to be invited. For as soon as Jesus sat down at table, he turned to the Pharisees asking where were the poor, and whether it was not their right to take part in the feast. The Pharisees were embarrassed, and they answered that the custom had long fallen into disuse. Then Jesus commanded his disciples Aristeria and Cocaria, the sons of Marha, and Kaliah, the son of the widow Saba, to go gather together the poor of the city and bring them to the feast. The Pharisees were highly displeased at the command, for it gave rise to much comment throughout the city. Many of the poor were already in bed and asleep. I saw the disciples rousing them. Numerous and varied were the joyous scenes I then witnessed in the huts and haunts of the poor. At last they arrived and were received and welcomed by Jesus and his disciples. The latter served them while Jesus addressed to them a very beautiful instruction. The Pharisees, though greatly irritated, had not a word to say, for Jesus was in the right, and at this the people rejoiced. Great excitement prevailed in the city. After partaking plentifully of the various good things, the poor people departed, taking with them a supply for their friends at home. Jesus had blessed the food for them, prayed with them, and exhorted them to go to John's baptism. He would not tarry longer in the city, and left that night with his followers. Many of the latter, however, discouraged partly by his exhortations, left him for their homes while others went to prepare for John's baptism. Jesus journeyed during the night between two valleys. I saw him sometimes conversing with his followers, then again falling behind and praying on his knees to his father, after which he again rejoined them. On the following afternoon I saw him arrive at a shepherd village whose houses lay scattered here and there. It possessed a school, but no resident priest, 
the people were attended by one from a distance. When Jesus arrived, the school was closed. He assembled the shepherds in an apartment of the inn, and there instructed them. As the Sabbath was approaching, there came that evening several priests of the sect of the Pharisees, some of them from Nazareth. Jesus spoke of baptism and the near advent of the Messiah. The Pharisees were very hostile toward him. They spoke of his humble origin and tried to make little of him. Jesus slept here that night. Jesus, in his instructions on the Sabbath, expounded many parables. He called for a grain of mustard seed and, when they brought it to him, he spoke for some time of it, saying that if they had faith equal only to a grain of that seed, they would be able to transport the pear tree before them into the sea. A large pear tree laden with fruit stood nearby. The Pharisees mocked at his teaching, which they considered childish. Jesus explained at length, but I have forgotten. He also recounted the parable of the unjust steward. The people of this place and of the whole country around were in admiration of Jesus. They related what they had heard from their fathers of the teaching and works of the last prophets, and they compared this new teacher to them with this exception, however, that he was much milder. The shepherd settlement was named Shimki. The hills of Nazareth could be discerned in the distance, for they were only about two hours off. It was a scattered little place, a few houses only around the synagogue. Jesus took up his abode with a poor family, the mistress of which lay sick of the dropsy. He had compassion upon her and cured her, laying his hand upon her head and stomach. She was perfectly restored and served her guest at table. Jesus forbade her to speak of what had happened until he should have returned from the baptism. Whereupon she asked why she might not tell it everywhere. Jesus answered, If thou wilt publish it everywhere, thou shalt become dumb. And she did become dumb, and remained so until his return from baptism. At this time it may have been about fourteen days until then, for at Bethulia or Jezreel he had spoken of three weeks. Jesus taught three days in the synagogue of this place. The Pharisees were greatly incensed against him. He spoke of the coming of the Messiah, saying, Ye are expecting him to appear surrounded by worldly glory. But he is already come, and he will make his appearance as a poor man. He will teach truth. He will get more blame than praise, for he wills justice. But separate not from him, that ye may not be lost. Be ye not like those children of Noah who mocked him when he so laboriously built the ark that was to save them from the flood. All they that derided not went into the ark and were saved. Then turning to his disciples, he addressed them, saying, Separate not from me like Lot from Abraham when, seeking more fertile regions, he went to Sodom and Gomorrah. And look not around after the glory of the world which fire from heaven shall destroy, that ye may not be turned into pillars of salt. Remain with me under every trial. I will always help you, etc. The Pharisees, still more irritated, exclaimed, What is this that he promises them, seeing that he has nothing himself? Then turning to him, they asked, Art thou not from Nazareth, the son of Joseph and Mary? But Jesus answered evasively that he whose son he was would manifest it. Then they continued, Why dost thou speak here as elsewhere of the Messiah? We have heard of thy teaching. Thinkest thou indeed that we shall imagine that thou meanest thyself? Jesus answered, Upon that question I have nothing to say, excepting these words, Yes, ye do think it. The excitement in the synagogue became great. The Pharisees extinguished the lights while Jesus and the disciples, although it was night, left the place and journeyed some distance along the high road. I saw them sleeping under a tree. On the following morning I saw crowds of people on the road waiting for Jesus. They had not been with him in that last place, but had gone on ahead of him. I saw him turning aside from the road with them and, about three o'clock in the afternoon, corning up to another shepherd field and it were only some light huts occupied by the shepherds in grazing time. There were no women here. The shepherds went forward to meet Jesus. They must have been informed of his corning by those that had gone on before. While some of their number went to meet him, the others busied themselves killing birds and lighting a fire in order to prepare a meal. This took place in an open hall, something like an inn, 
the fireplace being separated from the guest room by a wall. All around the hall ran a mossy bank with a plaited support for the back overgrown by green foliage. The host led the Lord and his followers in, about twenty in number, equal to that of the shepherds themselves. All washed their feet, a separate basin being assigned to Jesus. He asked for more water and, after using it, commanded it not to be thrown out. When all were ready for table, Jesus questioned the shepherds, who appeared anxious about something, as to the cause of their trouble, and asked if there were not some of their number absent. In answer to his questions, they acknowledged that they were sad on account of two of their companions who were lying sick of leprosy. Fearing that it might be the unclean leprosy, and dreading lest Jesus might not come to them on that account, they had taken care to conceal them. Then Jesus ordered them to be brought before him, and he sent some of his disciples after them. At last, they appeared so closely enveloped from head to foot in sheets that it was with great difficulty they could walk, though each was supported on either side. Jesus addressed them, telling them that their leprosy had come not from within, but from an outward infection. While he spoke, I was spiritually enlightened that, not through malice, but through temptation they had sinned. Jesus commanded them to wash in the water which he had used for his feet. They obeyed, and I saw the crusts falling from them leaving the scars behind. The water was then poured into a hole in the ground and covered with earth. Jesus strictly commanded the good people to say not a word of their cure until he should have returned from the baptism. He afterward gave an instruction upon John, the baptism, and the coming of the Messiah. His hearers questioned him very simply as to which they should follow, himself or John, and they desired to know which was the greater. Jesus answered, The greatest is he who serves as the least and last of all. He who for the love of God humbles himself as the least is the greatest. He exhorted them also to go to the baptism, spoke of the difficulties to be encountered in following him, and sent away all that had done so excepting the five disciples. He appointed a meeting place in the desert, not far from Jericho, I think in the region of Afra. Joachim had owned a pasture ground in those parts. Some of Jesus' hearers left him entirely, some went straight to John, while others returned home to prepare for their journey to the baptism. Jesus and the five disciples afterward went on to Nazareth, which at most was only about a short hour's distance. They approached by the side whose gate opens to the east on the road leading to the Sea of Galilee, but they went not into the city. Nazareth had five gates. A little less than a quarter of an hour's distance from the city rose the mountain from whose steep summit they often hurled people, and whence, at a later period, they wanted to cast Jesus. At the foot of this mountain lay some huts. Jesus directed the five disciples to seek lodgings in them, as he did himself. They were supplied with water to wash their feet, a piece of bread, and a place in which to sleep. Anna's property lay to the east of Nazareth. The shepherds had bread baked in the ashes, also a well dug in the earth, but without masonry. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death, Amen.